Good afternoon, and welcome to our February History at Home program. Today it's going to be on the building of the Erie Canal, and it's by Dick Campbell. And Dick was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he graduated from Butler University. He was, he's married with three children. Um, he served for three years of active duty with the Air Command as a pilot officer flying the KC-97 in-flight refueling aircraft. He's been a professional YMCA director for over 35 years, and he retired from Oshkosh after 22 years in 1993. He currently lives in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and he's very active in the community as members of the Rotary Club, the EAA Museum, the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce, Meals on Wheels, Readers in Schools. He's very, very active. <laughs> and he's been a longtime student of history storyteller, and he has 13 program presentations, which he calls The Great Moments in History. Since 1999, he has shared these PowerPoint stories with local Oshkosh community groups and many other organizations throughout Wisconsin and even up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And he was here last month for Charles Lindbergh. So that was very interesting. Okay, and there are some books on Great Lakes Erie Canal that are outside the room if you want to check any of those out. And here's Dick Campbell. Thank you, Mary. Well, again, my name is Dick Campbell. I'm from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Been living there for quite a few years now. And I want to welcome you to another one of what I like to refer to as one of my great moments in history presentations. Was anybody here last month for the Lindbergh? Okay. Thank you for coming back. Appreciate that. No, I really appreciate that. I have 13 altogether. Yes, sir. Well, that's up to Mary. <laughs> that's up to Mary. I'd be glad to, yeah. Five of, five of those are related to World War II events, yeah. Because since 1999, in the last 20 years, I have, I have put these programs, these 13 programs together. They're around subjects that have interested me for many, many years. And today, I'd like to share one of these stories with you entitled The Building of the Erie Canal. 202 years ago, construction of the Erie Canal began in 1817. It took eight years and thousands of workers to complete and opened in 1825. It was built to create a navigable water route from New York City and the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, and is considered the engineering marvel of the 19th century. When the federal government concluded that the project was too ambitious to undertake, the state of New York on, took on the task of carving the canal through the wilderness with nothing but muscle power of men and animals. Solving engineering problems required sheer genius and involved draining swamps, constructing aqueducts and locks, making cement that hardened underwater, and clearing forests. It was a man-made waterway spanning valleys and rivers, channeling through hills of solid rock or climbing over them flowing across marshes and thickly wooded forests, all the way across New York State. And it seemed to be a preposterous idea. Even President Thomas Jefferson, usually several thoughts ahead of his time, believed that such a canal could not be realistically considered for at least another century. And yet, the Erie Canal was built, and it worked just as its inexperienced builders believed it would. For the first time in history of the United States, 
A cheap and fast route ran through the Appalachians, the mountain chain that had so effectively divided the West from the East of early America. And with this breach, the fertile interior became accessible. The great inland lakes of America were linked to all the seas of the world. On June 6, 1777, the idea of a canal was first discussed by Governor Morris, a member of the First Continental Congress during our War for Independence. Morris was with a group of American officers when they were retreating down the Hudson River with 3,000 American soldiers from Fort Ticonderoga before General John Burgoyne's pursuing British Army. It hardly seemed a time to be talking about great plans for the future, especially something <clears throat> as vast as a canal to span the wilderness of Upper New York. But that's what Morris chose to discuss during their retreat down the river. Morris told the American officers that the Mohawk River joins the Hudson River from the west. He painted a word picture of a waterway which would extend from the Hudson through the valley of the Mohawk all the way to Lake Erie. These waters, Morris said, quote, would carry an endless procession of boats bearing passengers and goods to and from the war Western territories of the new country by way of the Great Lakes. To Morris, then, goes the honor of being one of the first men to consider seriously the tremendous potential of an inland waterway cutting across New York State. He connected, in, by connecting the Hudson River with Lake Erie, this waterway would breach at last the extensive mountain, mountain barrier that had divide, divided the country at that, at that time. It would also effectively open up trade between the east and the west. The notion of a canal connecting the eastern seaboard to the west had been an active topic of discussion for more than 20 years before construction actually began in 1817. The Appalachian Mountain Range, <coughs> pictured here, posed a formidable barricade between the narrow line of states touching the Atlantic Ocean and the almost boundless lands on the other side of the mountains. While rivers often lead the people on opposite sides of their banks to join in forming one community, populations divided by mountains tend to become separate nations unless some easy means of communication exists between the two. George Washington was keenly aware of this risk. Even before the American Revolution in 1775, he had expressed his concerns about the peril of losing the lands on the western side of the Appalachian Mountains to either France or Canada or both, unless the mountain barrier could be pierced and soon. If nothing were done, the young United States would be left squeezed between the mountains and the sea, a constricted minor league nation compared with the growth and power developing on the other side of the mountains. The great need was for a new and easy road through the mountains. But in all the hundreds of miles of mountain country, between the gap cut by the St. Lawrence River on the north and Alabama on the south, where the mountains dwindle away, there is only one real break, the valley where the Mohawk and the Hudson Rivers meet. The Hudson River part of the route was all a traveler could ask for. Nature had made it deep and wide and calm with little current. The Mohawk River was different. It was dangerous in high water and impassable in low. Before the Erie Canal was built, 
travelers heading <coughs> heading west who took a Hudson River boat to the juncture of the two rivers were prevented from changing to another boat to continue up the Mohawk and had to offload their possessions aboard a wagon at Albany, New York, and then travel for 17 miles over a rough land trail to Schenectady, New York, where the Mohawk River became a little tamer. From there, the travelers hired a boat to pull them up to the river to Little Falls, New York, where everyone got out again while the boat was, boat was hauled around the waterfalls. Then the break, back-breaking work of a pole lining against the current began again. When the river became too small for the boat, another wagon was hired, and the westbound travelers continued overland to Lake Ontario. There, they took another lake boat as far as the Niagara River, where there was more, la there was more land travel to get around the falls and rapids. Then, at Buffalo, New York, the travelers piled aboard a Lake Erie <laughs> uh, boat and crossed into the west. Yet even with these tremendous difficulties, this was one of the favorite ways to go west. Beginning in 1792, attempts were made to provide a way by water from the Hudson River to Lake Ontario. But soon both money and enthusiasm were gone, and the rough and rocky Mohawk River was not much change at that time. But the workers managed to construct small locks around Little Falls and to dig a small canal. The work was crude and only partly finished, but it gave a hint of what a real waterway along this route would mean. As I mentioned earlier, the Hudson Mohawk Gap is a thing of undeniable importance. It is a geographic feature composed of a pair of joined valleys that cut through the hills of the eastern United States. It offered an obvious route between the Atlantic Ocean and the lakes of the American Midwest. At one of the, at one of the gap, lies the city of New York. At the time that this saga began in the early 19th century, it was only a modest-sized port, bustling, but in no sense a metropolis of world-class power. At the Gap's other end were the twin cataracts of, of Niagara Falls. Together with the long westward, westward chain of the Great Lakes. It might fairly be claimed that New York City owes its very existence of a, as a world-class city to the presence and human exploitation of the Hudson Mohawk Gap. Of all the early tap backers of the lake, the Erie, Can the Erie Canal, one of the most intriguing was a wheat flour merchant named Jesse Hawley. In 1805, Hawley was grumbling about his inability to send his flour cheaply and efficiently from his mills in Seneca Falls, New York, down to the bakers in New York City. The roads were terrible. In summer, the old Indian trails were chokingly dusty or the low-lying parts, mosquito-filled swamps. And in the winter, the roads were often blocked by deep snows. The only alternative to Hawley was the river, except that the tolls that then being charged by a company which had built a small number of bypass locks on the Mohawk River were outrageous. There was no doubt, Hawley declared, that this part of New York State could survive and prosper only if a canal was to be built that would slice down the valley of the Mohawk to the point where it joined the Hudson River. Long a proponent, proponent of efficient water transportation, Hawley had gone bankrupt trying to get his products to market. 
sent to debtor's prison as a result, Hawley wrote a series of 14 essays which were published in the Genesee Messenger Weekly newspaper beginning in 1807, describing in great detail the route, the costs, and the benefits of what would become the Erie Canal. These essays were all concerned with the future of the region. They were well considered and elegantly written. Were a canal to be built, Hawley wrote, quote, the trade of all the lakes in North America would center at New York City for their common mart. And in a century, its island would be covered with the buildings and population of its city, end quote. Hawley was quite specific, was also quite specific, offering in great detail recommendations for the route the Kamenet Canal might follow. He forecast the number of locks that would be needed and the rate of ascent of the suggested route. Lake Erie is 565 feet above sea level. The Hudson River at the mouth of the Mohawk River, just five feet. <clears throat> the resulting 560 foot climb, as shown on the profile below, would have to be accomplished with 36 locks, according to Hawley, over a 363 mile route. Hawley also predicted what revenues might be expected, where the canal's water might come from, and how much the construction would cost. Finally, Hawley argued vocally and very well that the state of New York should finance the project. As badly as the canal proponents wanted federal funds for the canal project, they needed a local champion even more. So, in 1810, Thomas Eddy and Jonah, Jonas Platt from New, the New York State Legislature enlisted the support of DeWitt Clinton, the most powerful politician in the state then. At that time, Clinton was 43 years old, mayor of New York City, and the Democratic leader of the state. Clinton's decision to participate was the pivotal moment in this story. He was the one individual with the political skill and intellectual authority to turn Governor Morris's bold vi vision into reality. Once he considered the possibilities, Clinton was willing to put his entire future on the line for the canal. His firm leadership, his extraordinary eloquence, and his brilliant analytical capabilities brought the boundless benefits of the canal to New York State and ultimately to the United States of America. There might never have been an Erie Canal with Clinton's, without Clinton's unwavering support. The financing of the Erie Canal was as original and brilliantly successful as its technological features. When the U.S. government in Washington finally rejected sponsorship of the canal in 1816, New York proceeded to finance the canal by selling its own bonds to the public at large and to financially, the financial markets abroad. The flow of revenues collected on the canal was so far in excess of operating expenses that the state was able to repay these bonds well ahead of schedule. Most important, Americans perceived the canal as an expression of faith in the potentials of a free society, a message of hope for a great nation on the move. All of the leaders of the campaign for the canal shared a view of how the future would unfold if the commercial connection between East and West could be secured. Their foresight was remarkable as almost every feature 
of their wonderful dream came true. In 1817, DeWitt Clinton was elected governor of New York, and he then persuaded the New York Senate on April 15, 1817, to put up $7 million seed money for the Erie Canal construction. Naturally, with a sum like this taken from the Treasury, there would be critics and naysayers, such as Clinton's folly, or along with Clinton's big ditch. But their objections were brushed aside. On July 4, 1817, 10 years after Jesse Hawley's first essays were published, construction began in the town of Rome, New York. The completion of the Erie Canal spurred the first great westward movement of the American settlers, gave access to the rich land and resources west of the Appalachians, and made New York City, as pictured here, the preeminent commercial city in the United States, as shown on this 1836 map. As a point of interest, the primary attraction of moving boats and cargo on a canal instead of on a river is in the calm and flat surface over which a canal boat can travel without having to deal with upst either upstream or downstream currents of the river. A well-built boat floating on water could carry much more freight at no slower a speed than a horse-drawn wagon rumbling along a bumpy road. On most canals at that time, boats had no motive power of their own, but were pulled along by horses or mules walking on a towpath by the side of the canal. Although this sounds like a primitive means of locomotion, in reality, it was the critical technological advantage over travel by road or by river. By allowing the boat to move smoothly along its waters, the canal avoided all the heavy human efforts on rivers spent pushing boats with poles upstream and controlling the speed of boats when moving downstream, which was a major obstacle on the Mohawk River. As a result, a canal could carry larger boats with cargo carrying capacity than boats forced to confront the trials of river travel. Before construction had begun on the Erie Canal, a commission was appointed to study the problems of digging the canal. The commissioners traveled into the wilds of western New York to look over the path of the proposed canal. After a survey, they recommended that the waterway run beside the Mohawk River only as far as Utica, New York, and from there continued on to Lake Erie in its own path. The Erie Canal project was divided into three parts, the western, the middle, and the eastern, as shown on this elevation profile. The middle section was deemed to be the greatest priority because it would significantly extend the navigation from the existing natural waterways based upon the rivers. It also was the relatively easiest to build. The hope was that the completion of the middle section would increase public support for the project. The wilderness village of Rome, New York, at first glance, might seem an odd place to start digging a canal. It was out on the edge of nowhere at that time. Materials and tools would have to be hauled into Rome over difficult trails and waterways or fashioned on the spot. But it was the town nearest the upper limit of navigation on the Mohawk River, and it was also near the middle section of the canal 
for the digging would be the easiest. No lock or aqueducts would be needed for 80 miles of that section. From end to end, Hudson River to Lake Erie, the canal would be 363 miles long. The, ori the original channel of the canal was to be 40 feet wide at the surface and would slope inward to 28 feet at the bottom, as shown on this slide. The water in the channel would be four feet deep. Along the length of the canal, there would be a towpath 10 feet wide. To overcome natural obstacles in the path of the canal, two indispensable devices were also needed, locks and aqueducts. Digging a ditch with these requirements, with requirements with hand labor using axes, picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows through hundreds of miles of this primeval forest was the greatest challenge the builders of the Erie Canal would have to confront. The only sources of power were human muscle plus horses and oxen. They had no power equipment at that time in 1817. So they devised ways to increase their efficiency without adding to their workload. The men who made up the workforce were one quarter Irish immigrants, along with European immigrants and native born Americans. They were paid 80 cents a day, plus room and board, and a daily ration of whiskey. The room and board was sleeping on the floor on a board. Not a yard of ditch could be dug until the workers had cut down the countless thousands of trees, chopped them up in movable sizes, uprooted the stumps, and then carted away the staggering mess of logs, branches, and leaves. They had to clear mile after mile of woods and fell trees, many of which were six to seven feet in diameter. Regarding those giant trees, for instance, it was not very long before they had one man pulling them over. Someone devised a technique whereby a chain was tied high in a tree with the other end leading to a wheel, which was controlled by a woodsman with an endless screw gear. As the woodman wound the gear with a crank, the tree was very slowly pulled over with irresistible force until the cable bent the tree so far it finally broke free of its stump and crashed to the ground. Stumps, still on the earth, remained a challenge until some unsung genius came up with a stump pulling device shown here that was as effective as it was simple. It had two tremendous wheels, 17 feet in diameter, on the ends of a very sturdy axle, 30 feet long. Fixed at the center of the axle was a slightly smaller wheel, 14 feet in diameter, with a broad rim which held a coiled rope. This strange looking machine was hauled into place so it straddled the stump, and the big outer wheels were tied down to hold it steady. The chain wound around the axle was tied to the stump. A team of horses was hitched to the end of a rope wound around the rim of the middle wheel. As the animals moved forward, pulling the rope behind them and turning the wheel, the tremendous pressure on the chain yanked the stump and its roots free of the earth. Seven men and four horses could pull up to 30 to 40 stumps in one day with this rig. Another problem to overcome was finding a totally waterproof material to seal the spaces between the neatly arranged stones lining the sides of the excavation, the locks and the culverts and the aqueducts, 
all had to be lined. The available common quick line in use was unstable, breaking down under any sustained pressure. Then a young engineer, Canvas White, uncovered a local limestone that would not disintegrate when wet, unlike other limestone tried so far. White conducted experiments with the cement until he was satisfied he had the perfect mixture to make it waterproof under all conditions. And it worked. White also prepared the plans for all the mechanical structures, such as locks and gates, as well as some of the canal boats, even while continuing to provide expert surveying work. To help supervise the canal construction, the canal commissioners selected as chief engineers two New York lawyers, Benjamin Wright and James Geddes, whose only previous experience had been a little bit of surveying work. Both had a reputation for accuracy, though they were not engineers by profession. The commissioners felt that the two men were competent and intelligent enough to solve the problems of canal construction on the job. And in the end, the commissioners turned out to be right. Another person selected was Nathan Roberts. Roberts was given the task of finding a solution to one of the greatest obstacles faced by the Erie Canal engineers. Near Niagara Falls, in the western section, a sharply rising rock cliff soared more than 60 feet above to surrounding land. To reach Lake Erie, the engineers had to find a way to get boats up and over this 60-foot ridge. Normally, engineers use locks, use a lock to enable boats to move between sections of a canal with different water levels. A lock has a set of gates at each end. <clears throat> A boat going from a lower level to a higher level, as shown on this slide, enters the lock through the lower gates, which are then closed behind it. Water is let into the lock to raise the boat to the level of the higher section. Then the gates at the end of the lock are opened and the boat passes through. Here's an example of a boat going through a lock from a higher level to a lower level. Roberts knew that it wouldn't be possible to reach the top of the 60-foot rise in the Niagara Escarpment, as it was called, with a single pair of locks. Accordingly, with no one to help him and no guidance except for a few books, he designed a double set of five locks that resembled a flight of stairs, one set for eastbound and one set for westbound travel, as shown here on this slide. Each lock had a lift of 12 feet instead of the usual 8 feet 4 inches and was cut out of solid rock, as was the towpath on its approach to the locks. At one point on their, sh their shelf, like towpath, horses and drivers were a dizzy 60 feet above the canal, as shown in the lower picture on this slide. <clears throat> in the upper picture, the section, this section of the Erie Canal involved deep cutting, frequently through solid rock between Buffalo and Lockport, New York, to keep the level below that of Lake Erie. Nothing this difficult had ever been done before, and Robert's flight of five became one of the great wonders of this construction project. Another challenge to the, engineer, the engineers faced was how to get across rivers and creeks. The solution was an aqueduct bridge, which had to be wide enough for the canal itself and for the towpath alongside of it. 
The Erie Canal required 18 aqueduct bridges, one of the longest crossed the Genesee River at Rochester, New York. Over 800 feet long, it was built of huge stones, all of which had to be quarried and shaped by hand. Like the Flight of Five, the bridge at Rochester was admired as another one of the most amazing accomplishments of the canal. Here's another picture from about 1825 of the Genesee River Aqueduct. All that was done by hand. The middle section was finished in 1820. Continuous transportation was now available to shipping and travel through the flat country, as noted here at the western end and, and through to Rome and onward into the eastern section as far as Utica. Toward the end of 1820, construction crews started work on the stretch running east from Utica to Albany and the terminus of the canal at the Hudson River. By the end of 1821, Navigation on the eastern sec section was opened on the stretch 24 miles from Utica to Little Falls, and the difficult excavation from Little Falls to Albany was well advanced. The landscape at Little Falls was the most defiant in the entire valley, described by one traveler as, quote, the wildest place on the canal, end quote. By November 1821, the engineers began to fill the canal with water through the grueling 62-mile eastern section from Little Falls to Schenectady. This passage, as shown on this profile slide, was rocky and full of rapids. Thirteen locks with a total drop of 90 feet were necessary at this point. The work became even more demanding below Schenectady, <coughs> where the land dropped over 200 feet in the 16 miles to Troy, New York. 53 locks had to be constructed, constructed in the 100-mile stretch between Albany and Schenectady. Also, two aqueducts were needed, one 744 feet long, at Little Falls with three huge stone arches 30 feet high. The other at 1188 feet long at Schenectady with 26 pier piers supporting it, pictured here. This was the longest of the 18 aqueducts on the canal, all built by hand. Later, in 1824, when the whole com complicated and treacherous eastern construction from Utica to the Hudson River was complete, with all the daunting obstacles overcome, the commissioners could hardly believe their extraordinary achievement. Their report of that year admitted that it, if construction had begun there without the experience gained from the earlier work, on the relatively easy build, middle section, building the canal would have been unsuccessful and the completion of the project would have possibly been postponed for decades. The western section of the Erie Canal was the last section to be finished. With its completion, the entire canal was about ready to open. A small number of unfinished right. details remained. They built waylocks, waylocks at Troy, Utica, and Syracuse, on which boats weighed in to determine the amount of toll they had to pay. Incidentally, over the period from 1824 to 1882, the total tolls collected amounted to about $121 million. And then, after eight years at a cost of $7.13 million, 
the, Oregon, the Erie Canal construction was officially completed on October 26, 1825. It was acclaimed as an engineering marvel that united the country and helped New York City become a financial capital. The event was marked by statewide grand, grand celebration, culminating in successive cannon shots along the length of the canal and the Hudson River, a 90-minute cannonade from Buffalo to New York City. A flotilla of boats led by DeWitt Clinton aboard the Seneca Chief, pictured here, sailed east from Buffalo to New York City in nine days. Clinton then ceremoniously poured Lake Erie water into New York Harbor to mark the wedding of the waters. On his re its return trip west, the Seneca chief brought a keg of Atlantic Ocean water back to Buffalo to be poured into Lake Erie by Buffalo's judge Samuel Wilkerson. When the construction of the canal was complete, and it was a long last time to celebrate the wedding of the waters, DeWitt Clinton spoke with more brevity and simplicity than with his usual flourishes. But he had the spirit of the occasion when he ended the ceremonies with these gentle words, quote, and may the God of heavens and the earth smile most propitiously on the work and render it subservient to the best interests of the human race, end quote. When the Great Waterway was completed, it received worldwide attention and awe. Many writers called it the 19th century wonder of the world. Canal song were composed across the country for various venues. Vaudeville shows commonly included stories and songs about the famous waterway. One of the most popular was the Erie Canal song, Low Bridge, Everybody Down, written in 1905 by Thomas Allen. Almost every school child in the country from the early 20th century to this day even has learned the first verse pictured here. The line, 15 miles on the Erie Canal, refers to the distance that teams of mules or horses would pull a canal boat along the towpath before being replaced by a fresh team of animals. Anybody ever sung that song in the audience here? I have a, a, a tape of that song, but I didn't have any method of playing it, but it's interesting to hear it. <laughs> and the warning cry about bridges was common because many of them were built as low as possible to save money. <clears throat> and low bridges connecting lands divided by the canal could also push inattentive passengers overboard while on the roof taking in fresh air and sightseeing. In summary, construction began in 1817 and took eight years and, include, and involved thousands of workers and $7.143 million to complete. Solving engineering challenges required sheer genius and involved draining swamps, constructing aqueducts, making cement that hardened underwater, clearing forests, and building the massive locks. When finished, Clinton's ditch covered 363 miles, was about 40 feet wide and 4 feet deep, and it rose 565 feet through a series of 83 locks. When the waterway opened in 1825, it unlocked the floodgates to western settlement. Even though within decades it would be eclipsed by the railway, the Erie Canal was an important and cheap mode of transporting goods across the state for more than a century. 
The Erie Canal reduced travel time in half and slashed shipping costs 90%. The typical cost for moving goods over land was about $100 per ton. Via the canal, the cost was about $10 per ton. Within 10 years of the canal's opening, that cost had dropped to $4 a ton. Tolls collected recouped construction costs in less than nine years. By 1882, the canal was so successful financially, those tolls were abolished altogether. Although it has been envisioned as a primary, primarily a commercial channel for freight boats, passengers also traveled on the canal's packet boats. In 1825, more than 40,000 passengers took advantage of the convenience and beauty of canal travel, as pictured on this slide. In the year 2000, the United States Congress designated the Erie Canal Way a National Heritage Corridor to recognize the national significance of the canal system as the most important works of civil engineering and construction in North America. And it continues to be enjoyed today by many boaters, hikers, bicyclists, as well as cross-country skiers in the winter as a recreational and tourist attraction. It's been worked on over the years, the 202 years, and shortened and widened and deepened, and, and but it's still in use, uh, not as much for traveling goods, but for recreational purposes. And now you know the rest of the story. And I thank you for your interest in this great moment in history. And here are some of the resources that I uh, have used to put this program together. And there's a few copies of this over on my resource table to my right here, if you'd like, anybody would like to take those. And uh, this is a um, copy of the 13 subjects that uh, I, have put, I mentioned earlier that I have put together, and so far we've been in two of them. One, two, uh, last, one last month, and then one again uh, this month, and we're going to be doing this again at 6 o'clock tonight. If you have any friends that couldn't make it this afternoon or would be welcome to come back at, to the library tonight. And also I have, uh, in, to follow up the list of those, off to my table there's a, my non-business business card, which my son put together for me, uh, has a listing of all 13 subjects on the back of it, if you're, if you're interested. And I would welcome you back to any of the library programs they have here. This is a wonderful library here in Fond du Lac. And um, they have some great programs throughout the year, as well as some great reading. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you again. And are there any comments? Anybody who has been to the traveled on the Erie Canal here? We've got one. Anybody else? Pardon? Now I have to go. I, know, I have not. I have not been up in that. Do you have? And you have? Yeah. Yes, I have one question. Yes. Uh, this, it, it says something the story of the Wright brothers. Weren't the Wright brothers two of the ones that invented the transportation for the tribe adventure and the planes in the air? You're absolutely correct. And when that's presented, you'll have to come and you'll hear the whole story, how they invented the airplane and helped us gain flight. Yes, sir. How did I know that? Pardon? How did I know that? How did you know that? You've been reading something. Well, I'm sure. I heard about it. Then you heard about it. Well, if we do that one, you be sure and come. Okay. You had a question, sir. Yeah. Yes. Why they didn't follow Lake Ontario a good part of that distance without having to build a canal? It went right along it. They, I think they made efforts to do that earlier, I believe. But what they they? they wanted to keep keep it on a more of a straight line, I guess. Yeah. I don't know the, the actual answer to your question there. But they did. I know there were attempts made to get from there to Lake Ontario and then try to get into the next lake. <laughs> you know. Yes. Yes, sir. What is there about 
excuse me, the Erie Canal, that it lasted for many, many other canals that were built uh, kind of folded, like the, uh, oh, the Ohio Canal mm -hmm. and the Ohio River up to Lake Erie. That didn't, didn't last. Probably the use declined in those towns. I have one uh, piece on the resource table of all the canals in the United States. We've shown them. There are quite a few canals in the United States still in existence, and uh, for rec mostly for recreational purposes. But um, like anything, probably decline in usage. And uh, we have one going out of uh, um, Manasha or north of Oshkosh up to Green Bay that uh, now has, it's open the whole way except for one lock because they're, they're trying to keep the uh, fish, certain fish out of Lake Winnebago. And uh, otherwise they can, you could get in, you could go from Oshkosh to anywhere in the world by water if, that, if, if you had, had wanted to do that. But th that canal is still in use in certain areas. Good question, though. I'd yes, sir. I've always wondered about this. When you see the illustrations of the locks, yes. you see the step up or step downs, fill them with water, drain them of water, but you don't see where did that water, did they have big basins off the They ground? come in from various waterways coming into the... Mm -hmm. It's all gravity, right? They had mm -hmm. steam power. Mm -hmm. At 1817, that's what I always like to emphasize, they built the canal without steam power. They had some dynamite. They had a little bit of dynamite at the time, but uh, it was all pick and shovel and wheelbarrows. And that just amazes me. Seven years of pick and shovel and wheelbarrows. And it's much longer than the, I think, than the Panama Canal. It's 363 feet, or 363 miles in distance on it, and it's still in use, you know. Only it's in better better uh, mileage now. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When we hear about building the railroad, whether it's Panama Canal, mm -hmm. we hear about how many dead bodies it took to build it. Mm-hmm. So many per month. Do we have that kind of a... I do not know that exact figure, no, but there were, I'm sure, a few. I don't have that figure locked in. Uh, they're in Panama Canal, the same. Uh, that could be. I'll have to. I, I really don't. I can't know the answer to your question on that. But I can. I'll, I'm going to look that one up if I can. As they say, I'll try to Google it. <laughs> but yeah, there's always and that kind of construction. I'm sure there was uh, some that did not survive. Uh, I just did a program yesterday on building the Alaska Highway, and they lost 30 men, and that took eight months in, 18, in 1942. Great story, and, and right after the Pearl Harbor. And 30 men died in that eight-month period. I, know, I do have documented that. And that was just in terrible wilderness and weather. And, but I, th I will try to get that figure locked in. Thank you. Yes. Are all the locks and aqueducts still in use? Or Some of them, maybe. I have not traveled, so I can't answer that one either. Um, but I'm, some of them probably are, are, but they have to be. They have to be taken care of, like anything, construction. And uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. They have another canal next to the Panama Canal. You're kidding. You're kidding. Oh, the. Sh I've seen pictures that then they're they're about that far between the ship and the wall. Some of those, just amazing. Has you've been through there? What'd you go through on? Oh, really? Oh my goodness. Oh. How many locks are in the Panama? Uh, I can't tell you that. The, the, but there's, a, there's numbers <coughs> that you might think of. Yeah. There's a big lake in the middle. Oh, I am. Every, every about a half hour, you get another ship coming by. 
she. Oh my goodness. That, yes. Hmm. Oh, a portage? Okay. Yeah. I've not. <coughs> hmm. Well, that could. But there probably were a few in Wisconsin. I know uh, I came, uh, grew up in Indianapolis, and there's one that uh, is in the mid middle of Indiana that's uh, still there. Uh, it's not happily used. It goes right past the university, Butler University, and. And uh, people occasionally, I think, take their con kayaks or boat canoes on it. <laughs> That's about all. Yes, sir. It's okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, yes. He probably can find. What did you find out? A thousand? I'm not surprised. Oh my goodness. A thousand. Whoa. Well, that's amazing. Um, Okay, well, I don't know, Mary, when's, uh, someday we, we, we may, do you want to do any more of these, or is, I'll leave that, uh, is there anything, if, well, I won't ask, because they're all being different, but, uh, I'd like to share, the, I would like to share with you the, remembering the USS Indianapolis, definitely, uh, amazing, amazing story. And uh, there's new pic new stuff on that one that I put in my presentation. They found the Indianapolis at 18,000 feet, and it's in, lay in it's in mint condition. And I've got pictures that I show. Of they took the um, the founder of Microsoft and his team found it back in 18 or 19 2017. Excuse me. And uh, he's just since then, the last few months, it's passed away. But they found the Indianapolis, and they found the Yorktown that was sunk at the Battle of Midway, which I do talk about that. I have pictures of the Yorktown down about 18,000 feet that's in mint condition. Um, and they just found the USS Hornet. Anybody? And it was in the news just about a month or so ago. The famous aircraft carrier that took Doolittle and his crews to Tokyo in April of 1942. And um, yeah, that was a fa very famous, those three, and they found at 18,000 feet, and two and a half miles or three miles down. So yeah, I'll be glad to do any, anyone that you would like to, to do, and you have to, Mary has to check her schedule, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but hey, thanks for coming and tell your friends.